De Mundo by E. S. Forster. 1914. Chapter 1. Many a time, Alexander, has philosophy seemed to me a thing truly divine and supernatural, especially when in solitude she soars to the contemplation of things universal and strives to recognize the truth that is in them, and while all others abstain from the pursuit of this truth owing to its sublimity and vastness, she has not shrunk from the task nor thought herself unworthy of the fairest pursuits, but it has deemed the knowledge of such things at once most natural to herself and most fitting. For seeing that it was not possible, as once the foolish Aloedi attempted, by means of the body to reach the heavenly region and leaving the earth behind to spy out that to heavenly country, the soul by means of philosophy, taking the intellect as her guide, finding an easy path has traversed the intervening space and fared forth on its pilgrimage, and by intelligence comprehended things very far removed in space from one another, easily, methinks, recognizing those things which have kinship with one another, and by the divine eye of the soul apprehending things divine and interpreting them to mankind. This she felt, being desirous, as far as in her lay, freely to give to all men a share of her treasures. And so men who have laboriously described to us either the nature of a single region or the plan of single city or the dimensions of a river or the scenery of a mountain, as some air now have done, telling of Osso or Nissa or the Carician cave or giving us some other limited description, such men one should pity for their small-mindedness in admiring ordinary things and making much of some quite insignificant spectacle. They are thus affected because they have never contemplated what is nobler, the universe and the greatest things of the universe, for if they had really given attention to these things, they would never marvel at anything else, but all else would appear insignificant and, compared to the surpassing excellence of those other things of no account. Let us therefore treat of all these matters and, as far as possible, inquire into their divine nature, and discuss the nature and position and movement of each of them. And I think that it is but fitting that even you, who are the noblest of rulers, should pursue the inquiry into the greatest of all subjects and in philosophy entertain no trivial thoughts, and make the noblest among men welcome to these only of her gifts. Chapter 2. The universe then is a system made up of heaven and earth and the elements which are contained in them. But the word is also used in another sense of the ordering and arrangement of all things, preserved by and through God. Of this universe the center, which is immovable and fixed, is occupied by the life-bearing earth, the home and the mother of diverse creatures. The upper portion of the universe has fixed bounds on every side, the highest part of it being called heaven, the abode of the gods. Heaven is full of divine bodies, which we usually call stars, and moves with a continual motion in one orbit, and revolves in stately measure with all the heavenly bodies unceasingly forever. The whole heaven and universe being spherical and moving, as I have said, continually, there must of necessity be two points which do not move, exactly opposite to one another, as in the revolving wheel of a turner's lathe, points which remain fixed and hold the sphere together and round which the whole universe moves. The universe therefore revolves in a circle and the points are called poles. If we imagine a straight line drawn so as to join them, the axis, as it is sometimes called, it will form the diameter of the universe, occupying the center of the earth, with the two poles as its extremities. Of these fixed poles the one is always visible, being at the summit of the axis in the northern region of the sky, and is called the arctic pole, the other is always hidden beneath the earth to the south and is called the antarctic pole. The substance of the heaven and stars we call ether, not because it blazes owing to its fiery nature, as some explain the word, mistaking its nature, which is very far removed from fire, but because it is in continual motion, revolving in a circle, being an element other than the four indestructible and divine. Of the stars which are contained in it, those called fixed revolve only with the whole heaven, always occupying the same positions. A belt is formed through their midst by the so-called circle of the zodiac, which passes crosswise through the tropics, being divided up into the twelve regions of the signs of the zodiac. Others, which are called planets, do not naturally move with the same velocity as those stars of which I have already spoken, nor with the same velocity as one another, but each in a different course, so that one will be nearer the earth, another higher in the heavens. Now the number of the fixed stars cannot be ascertained by man, although they move in one surface, which is that of the whole heaven. But the planets fall into seven divisions in seven successive circles, 
so situated that the higher is I ways greater than the lower, and the seven circles are successively encompassed by one another and are all surrounded by the sphere containing the fixed stars. The position nearest to this sphere is occupied by the so-called circle of the shining star, or Kronos, next is that of the beaming star, which also bears the name of Zeus, then follows the circle of the fiery star, called by the names both of Heracles and of Ares, next comes the glistening star, which some call sacred to Hermes, others sacred to Apollo, after that is the circle of the light-bearing star, which some call the star of Aphrodite, others the star of Hera, then comes the circle of the sun and lastly that of the moon, which borders on the earth. The ether encompasses the heavenly bodies and the area over which they are ordained to move. After the ethereal and divine element, which we have shown to be governed by fixed laws and to be, moreover, free from disturbance, change, and external influence, there follows immediately an element which is subject throughout to external influence and disturbance and is, in a word, corruptible and perishable. In the outer portion of this occurs the substance which is made up of small particles and is fiery, being kindled by the ethereal element owing to its superior size and the rapidity of its movement. In this so-called fiery and disordered element flashes shoot and fires dart, and so-called beams and pits and comets have their fixed position and often become extinguished. Next beneath this spreads the air, which is in its nature murky and cold as ice, but becomes illuminated and set on fire by motion, and thus grows brighter and warm. And since the air too admits of influence and undergoes every kind of change, clouds form in it, rainstorms beat down, and snow, or frost, hail with blasts of winds and of hurricanes, and thunder too and lightning and falling bolts, and the crashing together of countless opaque bodies. Chapter 3. Next to the aerial element the earth and sea have their fixed position, teeming with plant and animal life, and fountains and rivers, either winding over the earth or discharging their waters into the sea. The earth is diversified by countless kinds of verdure and lofty mountains and densely wooded copses and cities, which that intelligent animal man has founded, and islands set in the sea and continents. Now the usual account divides the inhabited world into islands and continents, ignoring the fact that the whole of it forms a single island round which the sea that is called Atlantic flows but it is probable that there are many other continents separated from ours by a sea that we must cross to reach them, some larger and others smaller than it, but all, save our own, invisible to us. For as our islands are in relation to our seas, so is the inhabited world in relation to the Atlantic, and so are many other continents in relation to the whole sea, for they are as it were immense islands surrounded by immense seas. The general element of moisture, covering the earth's surface and allowing the so-called inhabited countries to rise in patches as it were of dry land, may be said to come immediately after the aerial element. Next to it the whole earth has been formed, firmly fixed in the lowest position at the midmost center of the universe, closely compacted, immovable and unshakable. This forms the whole of what we call the lower portion of the universe. Thus then five elements, situated in spheres in five regions, the less being in each case surrounded by the greater, namely, earth surrounded by water, water by air, air by fire, and fire by ether, make up the whole universe. All the upper portion represents the dwelling of the gods, the lower the abode of mortal creatures. Of the latter, part is moist, to which we are accustomed to give the names of rivers, springs and seas, while part is dry, which we call land and continents and islands. Of the islands, some are large, like the whole of what we call the inhabited world, and there are many other such surrounded by mighty seas, other islands are smaller, which are visible to us and in our own sea. Of these some are of considerable size, Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, Crete, Evia, Cyprus, and Lesbos, others are less extensive, such as the Sporides and Cyclades and others bearing various names. Again, the sea which lies outside the inhabited world is called the Atlantic or Ocean, flowing round us, opening in a narrow passage towards the west, at the so-called pillars of Heracles, the ocean forms a current into the inner sea, as into a harbour, then gradually expanding it spreads out, embracing great bays adjoining one another, opening into other seas by narrow straits and then widening out again. First, then, on the right as one sails in through the pillars of Heracles it is said to form two bays, the so-called sits, the greater and the lesser as they are called, on the other side it does not make such bays, 
but forms three seas, the Sardinian, the Gallic, and the Adriatic. Next to these comes the Sicilian Sea, lying crosswise, and after it the Cretan. Continuing it come the Egyptian, Pamphylian, and Syrian seas in one direction, and the Aegean and Myrtoan seas in the other. Over against the seas already mentioned extends the Pontus, which is made up of several parts, the innermost portion is called Meotis, while the outer portion in the direction of the Hellespont is connected by a strait with the so-called Propontis. Towards the east the ocean again flows in and opens up the Indian and Persian gulfs, and displays the Erythrian Sea continuous with these, embracing all three. With its other branch it passes through a long narrow strait and then expands again bounding the Hycanian and Caspian country. Beyond this it occupies the large tract beyond the lake of Meotis, then beyond the Scythians and the land of the Celts it gradually confines the width of the habitable world, as it approaches the Gallic Gulf and the pillars of Heracles already mentioned, outside which the ocean flows round the earth. In this sea are situated two very large islands, the so-called British Isles, Albion, and Ian, which are greater than any which we have yet mentioned and lie beyond the land of the Celts. The island of Taprobane opposite India, situated at an angle to the inhabited world, is quite as large as the British Isles, as also is the island called Feebol, which lies over against the Arabian Gulf, there is a large number of small islands round the British Isles and Iberia, forming a belt round the inhabited world, which as we have already said is itself an island. The width of the inhabited world at the greatest extent of its mainland is rather less than 40,000 states, so the best geographers say, and its length about 70,000 states. It is divided into Europe, Asia, and Libya. Europe is the tract bounded in a circle by the pillars of Heracles, the inner recesses of the Pontus, and the Hycanian Sea, where a very narrow isthmus stretches to the Pontus. Some have held, that the river Tanais carries on the boundary from this isthmus. Asia extends from the said isthmus and the Pontus and the Hycanian Sea to the other isthmus which lies between the Arabian Gulf and the inner sea, being surrounded by the inner sea and the ocean which flows round the world. Some, however, define the bounds of Asia as from the Tanais to the mouths of the Nile. Libya extends, from the Arabian Isthmus to the Pillars of Heracles, though some describe it as stretching from the Nile to the Pillars, Egypt, which is surrounded by the mouths of the Nile, is given by some to Asia, by others to Libya, some exclude the islands from both continents, others attach them to their nearest neighbor. Such is our account of the nature of land and sea and their position, the inhabited world as we call it. Chapter 4. Let us now deal with the most remarkable conditions which are produced in and around the earth, summarizing them in the barest outline. There are two kinds of exhalation which rise continually from the earth into the air above us, namely, those composed of small particles and entirely invisible, except when they occur in the east, and those which rise from rivers and streams and are visible. Of these the former kind being given off from the earth is dry and resembles smoke, while the latter being exhaled from the element of moisture is damp and vaporous. From the latter are produced mist and dew and the various forms of frost, clouds and rain and snow and hail, while from the dry exhalation come the winds and the different kinds of breezes and thunder and lightning, and hurricanes and thunderbolts, and all other cognate phenomena. Mist is a vaporous exhalation which does not produce water, denser than air but less dense than cloud, it arises either from the first beginnings of a cloud or else from the remnant of a cloud. The contrary of this is what is called a clear sky, being simply air free from cloud and mist. Dew is moisture minute in composition falling from a clear sky, ice is water congealed in a condensed form from a clear sky, or frost is congealed dew, and dew frost is dew which is half congealed. Cloud is a vaporous mass, concentrated and producing water. Rain is produced from the compression of a closely condensed cloud, varying according to the pressure exerted on the cloud, when the pressure is slight it scatters gentle drops, when it is great it produces a more violent fall, and we call this a shower, being heavier than ordinary rain, and forming continuous masses of water falling over earth. Snow is produced by the breaking up of condensed clouds, the cleavage taking place before the change into water, it is the process of cleavage which causes its resemblance to foam and its intense whiteness, while the cause of its coldness is the congelation of the moisture in it before it is dispersed or rarefied. When snow is violent and falls heavily we call it a blizzard. 
Hail is produced when snow becomes densified and acquires impetus for a swifter fall from its close mass, the weight becomes greater and the fall more violent in proportion to the size of the broken fragments of cloud. Such then are the phenomena which occur as the result of moist exhalation. From dry exhalation, impelled into motion by cold, is produced wind, for wind is merely a quantity of air set in motion in a mass. Wind is also called breath, a word used in another sense of the vital and generative substance which is found in plants and living creatures, and permeates all things, but with this we need not deal here. The breath which breathes in the air we call wind, while to the expirations from moisture we give the name of breezes. The winds which blow from moist land we call land winds, those which spring up from gulfs we call gulf winds, somewhat similar to these are those which blow from rivers and lakes. Winds which are produced by the bursting of a cloud causing an expansion of its density in their own direction, are called cloud winds. Those which are accompanied by a mass of water breaking forth are called rain winds. The winds which blow continuously from the rising sun are called Uri, those from the north, Bori, those from the setting sun, Zephyri, those from the south, Noti. Of the east winds, that which blows from the region of the summer sunrise is called Sasius, that which blows from the region of the equinoctial sunrise is known as Apelius, while the name of Eurus is given to the wind which blows from the quarter of the winter sunrise. Of the west winds, on the other hand, that which blows from the summer setting is Argestes, though some call it Olympius, others Iapix, that which blows from the equinoctial setting is Zephyrus, and that which blows from the winter setting is Lips. Of the north winds, Bori, that which is next to Sasius is called Boreas in the specific sense of the word. Apaxias is next to it, and blows in a southerly direction from the pole. Thracias is the wind which blows next to Argestes, by some it is called Circius. Of the south winds, that which comes from the invisible pole and immediately faces Apaxias is called Notus, that between Notus and Eurus is called Euronotus. The wind on the other side between Lips and Notus is called by some Libonotus, by others Libophoenix. Some winds are direct, those, that is, which blow along a straight line, others follow a bending course, as for instance the wind called Sasius. Some winds hold sway in the winter, the south winds for example, others in the summer, such as the Etesian winds, trade winds, which are a mixture of northerly and westerly winds. The so-called Ornithian winds, which occur in the spring, are a northerly type of wind. Of violent blasts of wind, a squall is one which suddenly strikes down from above, a gust is a violent blast which springs up in a moment, a whirlwind, or tornado, is a wind which revolves in an upward direction from below. An eruption of wind from the earth is a blast caused by the emission of air from a deep hole or cleft, when it comes forth in a whirling mass. It is called an earth storm. A wind which is whirled along in a dense watery cloud and being driven forth through it violently breaks up the continuous masses of the cloud, causes a roar and crash, which we call thunder, similar to the noise made by wind driven violently through water. When the wind in breaking forth from a cloud catches fire and flashes it is called lightning. The lightning reaches our perception sooner than the thunder, though it actually occurs after it, since it is the nature of that which is heard to travel less quickly than that which is seen, for the latter is visible at a distance, while the former is only heard. When it reaches the ear, especially since the one, the fiery element, travels faster than anything else, while the other, being of the nature of air, is less swift and only reaches the ear by actually striking upon it. If the flashing body is set on fire and rushes violently to the earth it is called a thunderbolt, if it be only half of fire, but violent also and massive, it is called a meteor, if it is entirely free from fire, it is called a smoking bolt. They are all called swooping bolts, because they swoop down upon the earth. Lightning is sometimes smoky, and is then called smoldering lightning, sometimes it darts quickly along, and is then said to be vivid, at other times it travels in crooked lines, and is called forked lightning, when it swoops down upon some object it is called swooping lightning. To sum up, some of the phenomena which occur in the air are merely appearances, while others have actual substance and reality. Rainbows and streaks in the sky and the like are only appearances, while flashes and shooting stars and comets and the like have real substance. A rainbow is the reflection of a segment of the sun or of the moon, seen, like an image in a mirror, in a cloud which is moist, 
hollow, and continuous in appearance, and taking a circular form. A streak is a rainbow appearing in the form of a straight line. A halo is an appearance of brightness shining round a star, it differs from a rainbow, because the latter appears opposite the sun and moon, while the halo is formed all round a star. A light in the sky is caused by the kindling of a dense fire in the air, some lights shoot along, others, saray fixed. The shooting is the generation of fire by friction, when the fire moves quickly through the air and by its quickness produces an impression of length, the fixture is a prolonged extension without movement, an elongated star as it were. A light which broadens out towards one end is called a comet. Some heavenly lights often last a considerable time, others are extinguished immediately. There are numerous other peculiar kinds of appearances seen in the sky, the so-called, torches, beams, comma barrels, and pits, which derive their names from their similarity to these objects. Some of them appear in the west, others in the east, others in both these quarters, but rarely in the north or south. None of them are subject to fixed jaws, for none of them have been discovered to be always visible in a fixed position, such are the phenomena of the air. As the earth contains many sources of water, so also it contains many sources of wind and fire. Of these some are subterranean and invisible, but many have vents and spiracles, as Lipera, Etna, and the volcanoes of the Aeolian Islands. Some of them frequently flow like rivers and cast up red-hot lumps. Some, which are under the earth near springs of water, warm them and cause some streams to flow tepid, others very hot, others tempered to a pleasant heat. Similarly, many vent holes for wind open in every part of the earth, some of them cause those who draw near to them to become frenzied, others cause them to waste away, others inspire them to utter oracles, as at Delphi and Libadia, others utterly destroy them, as the one in Phrygia. Often, too, a moderate wind engendered in the earth, being driven aside into distant holes and crannies of the earth and displaced from its proper locality, causes shocks in many parts. Often, too, a strong current from without becomes involved in the hollows of the earth, and, its exit being cut off, it shakes the earth violently, seeking an exit, and sets up the condition which we commonly call an earthquake. Earthquakes of which the shock is oblique, at a sharp angle, are known as horizontal earthquakes, those which lift the earth up and down at right angles are known as heaving earthquakes, those which cause the earth to settle down into hollows are called gaping earthquakes, those which open up chasms and break up the earth's surface are called rending earthquakes. Some of them also emit winds, others stones or mud, while others cause springs to appear which did not exist before. Some earthquakes cause a disturbance by means of a single shock and are known as thrusting earthquakes. Others which swing to and fro and by inclinations and waves in each direction remedy the effect of their shock, are called vibrating earthquakes, setting up a condition which resembles trembling. There are also bellowing earthquakes, which shake the earth with a roar. Underground bellowing, however, is often heard unaccompanied by shocks, when the wind, though insufficient to cause a shock, is compressed together in the earth and beats with the force of its impetus. Blasts which penetrate into the earth are materialized also from moisture concealed underground. We find analogous phenomena occurring in the sea. Chasms form in it and its waters often retire or the waves rush in. This is sometimes followed by a recoil and sometimes there is merely a forward surge of water, as is said to have occurred at Hellas and Bura. Often, too, there are exhalations of fire from the sea, and springs gush out and river mouths are formed and trees suddenly grow up, and currents and eddies appear, like those caused in the air by blasts of wind, sometimes in the middle of the sea, sometimes in straits and channels. Many tides and tidal waves are said always to accompany the periods of the moon at fixed intervals. In short, owing to the mingling of the elements together, similar conditions are produced in the air and in the earth and in the sea, causing decay and generation in detail, but preserving the whole free from destruction and generation. Chapter 5 Yet some have wondered how it is that the universe, if it be composed of contrary principles, namely, dry and moist, hot and cold, has not long ago perished and been destroyed. It is just as though one should wonder how a city continues to exist, being, as it is, composed of opposing classes, rich and poor, young and old, weak and strong, good and bad. They fail to notice that this has always been the most striking characteristic of civic concord, that it evolves unity out of plurality, 
and similarity out of dissimilarity, while it admits every kind and variety. It may perhaps be that nature has a liking for contraries and evolves harmony out of them and not out of similarities, just as she joins the male and female together and not oh members of the same sex, and has devised the original harmony by means of contraries and not similarities. The arts, too, apparently imitate nature in this respect. The art of painting, by mingling in the picture the elements of white and black, yellow and red, achieves representations which correspond to the original object. Music, too, mingling together notes, high and low, short and prolonged, attains to a single harmony amid different voices, while writing, mingling vowels and consonants, composes of them all its art. The saying found in her Pletus the Obscure was to the same effect, junctions are, holes and not holes, that which agrees and that which differs, that which produces harmony and that which produces discord, from all you get one and from one you get all. Thus then a single harmony orders the composition of the whole, heaven and earth and the whole universe, by the mingling of the most contrary principles. The dry mingling with the moist, the hot with the cold, the light with the heavy, the straight with the curved, all the earth, the sea, the ether, the sun, the moon, and the whole heaven are ordered by a single power extending through all, which has created the whole universe out of separate and different elements, air, earth, fire, and water, embracing them all on one spherical surface and forcing the most contrary natures to live in agreement with one another in the universe, and thus contriving the permanence of the whole. The cause of this permanence is the agreement of the elements, and the reason of this agreement is their equal proportion and the fact that no one of them is more powerful than any other, for the heavy is equally balanced with the light and the hot with the cold. Thus nature teaches us in the greater principles of the world that equality somehow tends to preserve harmony, whilst harmony preserves the universe which is the parent of all things and itself the fairest thing of all. For what created thing is more excellent? Any that one can name is but a part of the ordered universe. All that is beauteous bears its name, and all that which is arranged well, for it is said to be well ordered, being thus called after the ordered universe, and what subordinate phenomenon could be likened to the ordered system of the heavens and the march of the stars and the sun and the moon, which move on in unvarying measure through age after age. Where else could be found such regularity as is observed by the goodly seasons, which produce all things and bring in due order summer and winter, day and night, to the accomplishment of the month and the year. Moreover, in greatness the universe is preeminent, in motion swiftest, in radiance most bright, and in might it knows not old age or corruption. It has divided the various creatures that live in the sea, on the earth, and in the air, and regulated their lives by its movements. Of it all living things breathe and have their life. Even all the unexpected changes which occur in it are really accomplished in an ordered sequence, diverse winds conflicting together, thunderbolts falling from heaven, and violent storms bursting forth. The expulsion of moisture and the exhalation of fire by these means restores the whole to harmony and stability. The earth, too, clothed with diverse vegetation, gushing forth with streams and trodden by the feet of living creatures, in due season bringing forth, nurturing, and receiving back all things, producing countless varieties and changes, nonetheless always preserves its nature untouched by age, though shaken by earthquakes, washed by floods, and in part so burnt up by fires. All these things seem to work its welfare and to ensure its eternal permanence. For when it is shaken by earthquakes, the winds which have been diverted into it escape forth, finding vents through the clefts, as we have already said, when it is washed by rain, it is cleansed of all that is unhealthy, and when the breezes blow about it, it is purified above and beneath. Again, the fires soften that which is frost-bound, while the frosts abate the fires. Of individual things upon the earth some are coming into being, others are at their prime, others are decaying, and birth checks decay and decay lightens birth. Thus an unbroken permanence, which all things conspire to secure, counteracting one another, at one time dominating, at another being dominated, preserves the whole unimpaired through all eternity. Chapter 6. There still remains for us to treat briefly, as we have discussed the other subjects, of the cause which holds all things together. For in dealing with the universe, not perhaps in exact detail, yet at any rate so as to give a general idea of the subject, it would be wrong to omit that which is the most important thing in the universe. 
The old explanation which we have all inherited from our fathers, is that all things are from God and were framed for us by God, and that no created thing is of itself sufficient for itself, deprived of the permanence which it derives from him. Therefore some of the ancients went so far as to say that all those things are full of God which are presented to us through the eyes and the hearing and all the other senses, thus propounding a theory which, though it accords with the divine power, does not accord with the divine nature. For God is in very truth the preserver and creator of all that is in any way being brought to perfection in this universe, yet he endures not all the weariness of a being that administers and labors, but exerts a power which never wearies, whereby he prevails even over things which seem far distant from him. He hath himself obtained the first and highest place and is therefore called supreme, and has, in the words of the poet, taken his seat in heaven's topmost height. And the heavenly body which is nighest to him most enjoys his power, and afterwards the next nearest, and so on successively until the regions wherein we dwell are reached. Wherefore the earth and the things upon the earth, being farthest removed from the benefit which proceeds from God, seem feeble and incoherent and full of much confusion, nevertheless, inasmuch as it is the nature of the divine to penetrate to all things, the things also of our earth receive their share of it, and the things above us according to their nearness to or distance from God receive more or less of divine benefit. It is therefore better, even as it is more seemly and befitting God, to suppose that the power which is established in the heavens is the cause of permanence even in those things which are furthest removed from it, in a word, in all things, rather than to hold that it passes forth and travels to and fro to places which become and befit it not, and personally administers the affairs of this earth. For indeed, to superintend any and every operation does not become even the rulers among mankind, the chief, for example, of an army or a city, or the head of a household, if it were necessary to bind up a sack of bedding or perform any other somewhat menial task, such as in the days of the great king would not be performed by any ordinary slave. Nay, we are told that the outward show observed by Cambyses and Xerxes and Darius was magnificently ordered with the utmost state and splendor. The king himself, so the story goes, established himself at Susa or Ecbatana, invisible to all, dwelling in a wondrous palace within a fence gleaming with gold and amber and ivory. And it had many gateways one after another, and porches many furlongs apart from one another, secured by bronze doors and mighty walls. Outside these the chief and most distinguished men had their appointed place, some being the king's personal servants, his bodyguard and attendants, others the guardians of each of the enclosing walls, the so-called janitors and listeners, that the king himself, who was called their master and deity, might thus see and hear all things. Besides these, others were appointed as stewards of a his revenues and leaders in war and hunting, and receivers of gifts, and others charged with all the other necessary functions. All the empire of Asia, bounded on the west by the Hellespont and on the east by the Indus, was apportioned according to races among generals and satraps and subject princes of the great king, and there were couriers and watchmen, and messengers and superintendents of signal fires. So effective was the organization, in particular the system of signal fires, which formed a chain of beacons from the furthest bounds of the empire to Susa and Ecbatana, that the king received the same day the news of all that was happening in Asia. Now we must suppose that the majesty of the great king falls as far short of that of the god who possesses the universe, as that of the feeblest and weakest creature is inferior to that of the king of Persia. Wherefore, if it was beneath the dignity of Xerxes to appear himself to administer all things and to carry out his own wishes and superintend the government of his kingdom, such functions would be still less becoming for a god. Nay, it is more worthy of his dignity and more befitting that he should be enthroned in the highest region, and that his power, extending through the whole universe, should move the sun and moon and make the whole heaven revolve and be the cause of permanence to all that is on this earth. For he needs no contrivance or the service of others, as our earthly rulers, owing to their feebleness, need many hands to do their work, but it is most characteristic of the divine to be able to accomplish diverse kinds of work with ease and by simple movement, even as past masters of a craft by one turn of a machine accomplish many different operations. And just as puppet showmen by pulling a single string make the neck and hand and shoulder and eye and sometimes all the parts of the figure move with a certain harmony, so too the divine nature, by simple movement of that which is nearest to it, imparts its power to that which next succeeds, and thence further and further until it extends over all things. For one thing, moved by another, itself in due order moves something else, 
each acting according to its own constitution, and not all following the same course but different and various and, sometimes even contrary courses, although the first impulse, as it may be called, was directed to a single form of motion. It is just as though one should cast from one vessel at the same time a sphere, a cube, a cone, and a cylinder, each of them will move according to its particular shape. Or if one should hold in the folds of a garment a water animal, a land animal, and a bird, and let them go, clearly the animal that swims will leap into its own element and swim away, the land animal will creep away to its own haunts and pastures, the bird of the air will raise itself aloft from the earth and fly away, though one original cause gave each its aptitude for movement. So is it with the universe, by a single revolution of the whole within the bounds of day and night, the different orbits of all the heavenly bodies are produced, though all are enclosed in a single sphere, some moving more quickly, others more slowly, according to the distances between them and the individual composition of each. For the moon accomplishes her circuit in a month, waxing and waning and disappearing, the sun and the heavenly bodies whose course is of equal length, namely those called the light-bearer and Hermes, perform their revolution in a year, the fiery star in double that period, the star of Zeus in six years, and lastly the so-called star of Kronos in a period two and a half times as long as the heavenly body next below it. The single harmony produced by all the heavenly bodies singing and dancing together springs from one source and ends by achieving one purpose, and has rightly bestowed the name not of disordered but of ordered universe upon the whole. And just as in a chorus, when the leader gives the signal to begin, the whole chorus of men, or it, maybe of women, joins in the song, mingling a single studied harmony among different voices, some high and some low, so too is it with the God that rules the whole world. For at the signal given from on high by him, who may well be called their chorus leader, the stars and the whole heaven always move, and the sun that illumines all things travels forth on his double course, whereby he both divides day and night by his rising and setting, and also brings the four seasons of the year, as he moves forwards towards the north and backwards towards the south. And in their own due season the rain, the winds, and the dews, and all the other phenomena which occur in the region which surrounds the earth, are produced by the first, primeval cause. These are followed by the flowing of rivers, the swelling of the sea, the growth of trees, the ripening of fruits, the birth of animals, the nurturing and the prime and decay of all things, to which, as I have said, their individual composition contributes. When, therefore, the ruler and parent of all, invisible save to the mind of the eye, gives the word to all nature that moves betwixt heaven and earth, the whole revolves unceasingly in its own circuits and within its own bounds, sometimes unseen and sometimes appearing, revealing and again hiding diverse manners of things, from one and the same cause. Very like is it to that which happens in times of war, when the trumpet sounds to the army, then each soldier hears its note, and one takes up his shield, another dons his breastplate, another puts on his greaves or his helmet or his sword belt, one puts the bit in his horse's mouth, another mounts his chariot, another passes along the watchword, the captain betakes himself straightway to his company, the commander to his division, the horseman to his squadron. The light-armed warrior hastens to his appointed place, all is hurry and movement in obedience to one word of command, to carry out the orders of the leader who is supreme over all. Even so must we suppose concerning the universe, to by one impelling force, unseen and hidden from our eyes, all things are stirred and perform their individual functions. That this force is unseen stands in the way neither of its action nor of our belief in it. For the spirit of intelligence whereby we live and dwell in houses and communities, though invisible, is yet seen in its operations, for by it the whole ordering of life has been discovered and organized and is held together, the plowing and planting of the earth, the discovery of the arts, the use of law, the ordering of constitutions, the administration of home affairs and war outside our borders and peace. Thus, too, must we think of God, who in might is most powerful, in beauty most fair, in time immortal, in virtue supreme, for, though he is invisible to all mortal nature, yet is he seen in his very works. For all that happens in the air, on the earth, and in the water, may truly be said to be the work of God, who possesses the universe, from whom, in the words of Empedocles, the natural philosopher, whatsoever hath been and is now and shall be hereafter, all alike hath its birth, men, women, trees of the forest, beasts of the field and fowls of the air and fish in the water, 
To use a somewhat humble illustration, we might with truth compare the ordering of the universe to the so-called keystones in arches, which, placed at the junction of the two sides, ensure the balance and arrangement of the whole structure of the arch and give it stability. Moreover, they say that the sculptor Phidias, when he was setting up the Athena on the Acropolis, represented his own features in the center of her shield, and so attached it to the statue by a hidden contrivance, that anyone who tried to cut it out, thereby necessarily shattered and overthrew the whole statue. The position of God in the universe is analogous to this, for he preserves the harmony and permanence of all things, save only that he has his seat not in the midst, where the earth and this our troubled world is situated, but himself pure he has gone up into a pure region, to which we rightly give the name of heaven, for it is the furthest boundary of the upper world, and the name of Olympus, because it is all bright and free from all gloom and disordered motion, such as is caused on our earth by storms and the violence of the wind. Even thus speaks the poet Homer, unto Olympus height, where men say that the gods have their dwelling, always safe and secure, no wind ever shaketh its stillness, nor is it wet with the rain, no snow draweth nigh, but unclouded. Ever the air is outspread, and a white sheen floateth about it. This, too, is borne out by the general habit of mankind, which assigns the regions above to God, for we all stretch up our hands to heaven when we offer prayers. Wherefore these words of the poet are not spoken amiss, heaven belongeth to Zeus, widespread mid the clouds and the ether. Therefore also the objects of sense which are held in the highest esteem occupy the same region, to wit the stars and the sun and moon. For this cause the heavenly bodies alone are so arranged that they ever preserve the same order, and never alter or move from their course, while the things of earth, being mutable, admit of many changes and conditions. For ere now mighty earthquakes have rent the earth in diverse places, and violent rains have burst forth and flooded it, and the inroads and withdrawals of waves have often turned the dry land into sea and sea into dry land, and the might of winds and hurricanes has sometimes overthrown whole cities, and fires and flames have consumed the earth, either coming forth from heaven in former times, even as men say that in the days of Phaethon they burnt up the eastern regions of the earth, or else ushing forth and breathing from the earth in the west, as when the craters of Etna burst and flowed like a torrent over the earth. There also the favor of heaven bestowed a special honor upon the generation of the pious, when they were overtaken by the fiery stream, because they were carrying their aged parents upon their shoulders and seeking to save them. For when the river of fire drew near to them, it was parted asunder and turned part of its flame this way and part that way, and preserved the young men and their parents unscathed, to sum up the matter, as is the steersman in the ship, the charioteer in the chariot, the leader in the chorus, law in the city, the general in the army, even so is God in the universe, save that to them their rule is full of weariness and disturbance and care. While to him it is without toil or labor and free from all bodily weakness, for, enthroned amid the immutable, he moves and revolves all things, where and how he will, in different forms and natures, just as the law of a city, fixed and immutable in the minds of those who are under it, orders all the life of the state. For in obedience to it, it is plain, the magistrates go forth to their duties, the judges to their several courts of justice, the councillors and members of the assembly to their appointed places of meeting, and one man proceeds to his meals in the Prytaneum, another to make his defense before the jury, and another to die in prison. So too the customary public feasts and yearly festivals take place, and sacrifices to the gods and worship of heroes and libations in honor of the dead, the various activities of the citizens in obedience to one ordinance or lawful authority are well expressed in the words of the poet, and all the town is full of incense smoke, and full of cries for aid and loud laments. So must we suppose to be the case with that greater city, the universe. For God is to us a law, impartial, admitting not of correction or change, and better, methinks, and surer than those which are engraved upon tablets. Under his motionless and harmonious rule the whole ordering of heaven and earth is administered, extending over all created things through the seeds of life in each both to plants and to animals, according to genera, and or species. For vines and date palms and peach trees and sweet fig trees and olives, as the poet says, and trees which, though they bear no fruits, have other uses, plane trees and pines and box trees. Alder and poplar tree and cypress breathing sweet odors and trees which produce autumn crops pleasant but also difficult to store. Pear trees and pomegranate trees, 
and apple trees glorious fruited, and animals, both wild and tame, feeding in the air or on the earth or in the water, all are born and come to their prime and decay in obedience to the ordinances of God, for, in the words of Heraclitus, every creeping thing grazes at the blow of God's goad. Chapter 7. God being one yet has many names, being called after all the various conditions which he himself inaugurates. We call him Zen and Zeus, using the two names in the is same sense, as though we should say him through whom we live. He is called the son of Kronos and of time, for he endures from eternal age to age. He is God of lightning and thunder, God of the clear sky and of ether, God of the thunderbolt and of rain, so called after the rain and the thunderbolts and other physical phenomena. Moreover, after the fruits he is called the fruitful God, after cities the city God, he is God of birth, God of the house court, God of kindred and God of our fathers from his participation in such things. He is God of comradeship and friendship and hospitality, God of armies and of trophies, God of purification and of vengeance and of supplication and of propitiation, as the poets name him, and in very truth the Saviour and God of freedom, and to complete the tale of his titles, God of heaven and of the world below, deriving his names from all natural phenomena and conditions, inasmuch as he is himself the cause of all things. Wherefore it is well said in the Orphic hymns. Zeus of the flashing bolt was the first to be born and the latest. Zeus is the head and the middle, of Zeus were all things created, Zeus is the stay of the earth and the stay of the star-spangled heaven. Zeus is male and female of sex, the bride everlasting. Zeus is the breath of all and the rush of unwearying fire. Zeus is the root of the sea, and the sun and the moon in the heavens, Zeus of the flashing bolt is the king and the ruler of all men. Hiding them all away, and again to the glad light of heaven. Bringing them back at his will, performing terrible marvels. I think also that God and naught else is meant when we speak of necessity, which is as it were invincible being, and fate, because his action is continuous and he cannot be stayed in his course, and destiny, because all to things have their bounds, and nothing which exists is infinite, and lot, from the fact that all things are allotted, and nemesis, from the apportionment which is made to every individual, and adrastia, which is a cause ordained nature which cannot be escaped, and dispensation. So called because it exists for ever. What is said of the fates and their spindle tends to the same conclusion, for they are three, appointed over different periods of time, and the thread on the spindle is part of it already spent, part reserved for the future, and part in the course of being spun. One of the fates is appointed to deal with the past, namely, Atropos, for nothing that is gone by can be changed, Lachesis is concerned with the future, for cessation in the course of nature awaits all things, Clotho presides over the present, accomplishing and spinning for each his own particular destiny. This fable is well and duly composed. All these things are naught else but God, even as worthy Plato tells us. God, then, as the old story has it, holding the beginning and the end and the middle of all things that exist, proceeding by a straight path in the course of nature brings them to accomplishment, and with him ever follows justice, the avenger of all that falls short of the divine law, justice, in whom may he that is to be be happy, be from the very first a blessed and happy partaker.